Welcome to episode 16 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we learn how rumors about Gero came to the ears of Odin and how he uncovered the truth in the myth of the Lay of Grimnir. Rodding, king of the Goths, had two sons, Ochnar and Geirod. One day, when Ochnar was ten winters old and Geirod eight, the brothers gathered their tackle and went out rowing in the hope of landing some fish. But soon the wind began to bluster and the boys were driven so far out to sea that they lost sight of land. The night shadow grew long in the darkness, and the small boat tossed and spun and was smashed to pieces on a rocky shore. Standing bedraggled in the darkness with waves breaking around them, Achnar and Geirod had not the least idea of where they were. Next morning, the two boys found a poor peasant and stayed with him and his wife through the winter. The woman busied herself with Ochnar, and the man looked after the younger Gehrod and taught him many things. They often walked over the land together, and what they said to each other only they knew. When spring came, the peasant gave Gehrod the new boat that he had carved, carpentered, and pitched during the winter. Then one day, the man and his wife walked with the boys down to the shore. The man took Gehrod aside put an arm round his shoulders, and had a few words with him. Achnar and Gehrod stepped aboard, and helped by a fair wind, and acting on the advice the couple had given them, they had the good fortune to fetch up again to their father's landing stage. Gehrod was in the prow of the boat. He snatched the oars and jumped out. Then he gave the boat a great shove and yelled, "'Go where the trolls will get you!' His elder brother, Achnar, and the little boat drifted back out to the sea. When Gehrod walked into King Roding's hall, he found that his father had died during that winter. He was surrounded by a great company, eager to know where he had been, marveling that he had come back, shaking their heads when they heard from Gehrod that his brother, Achnar, heir to the throne, had been drowned months before. Then Gehrod was acknowledged as king of the Goths. His father's retainers now swore loyalty to him, and great things were expected of him as Rodding's son, all the more so after such a wondrous return. But the older Gehrod grew, the greater his faults became. He was not long before his nature, his sudden fits of anger, and his cruelty and tyranny became known throughout the Norse lands. Odin and Frigg sat in the high seat, Heilskilf, and look out over the world. Do you see, Ochnar, said Odin, your foster son? He's coupling with a giantess in a cave. He's fathering brutes. But my ward, Gehrod, is a king. He rules over a great country. He's so miserly, Frigg replied, that if guests visit when he is already entertaining, he pretends to welcome them and then has them tortured. That is nothing but vile slander, said Odin. Odin and Frigg agreed to put things to the test, and Frigg swiftly sent her maidservant, Fula, to Midgard with a message to Gerold. Beware, said Fula, of a magician who has come to your country and means to lay a spell on you. You will know him in this way. Even the fiercest dog will not leap at him. Now, in fact, it was a slander that Gehrod was unwelcoming. For all his untrustworthiness, his moods and his violence, he was generous and kept an open house. All the same, he heeded Fula's warning and told his followers to detain the traveler whom no dog would attack. It was not long before this man turned up at Gehrod's hall. He wore a dark blue cloak, and his name was Grimnir, the Hooded One. That, however, is all Grimnir would say. When he declined to explain where he had come from, or where he was going, or to declare his purpose, or to exchange any other common courtesies, Gerard became angry. He remembered Fula's warning. If you will not speak, he said, you must have 
reason not to. So, still, Grimnir said nothing. If you will not speak of your own will, he said, I will make you speak. And still, Grimnir said nothing. Then the king had Grimnir trussed and slung between two roasting fires like a pig on a spit. Until you talk, said Geirold. Grimnir hung between the fires for eight nights and said nothing. King Kehrod had a son ten winters old, called Ochnar after his brother. Everyone loved him. His father, the king, the retainers, their ladies, the servants in the court. And when he saw how Grimnir was suffering, he suffered with him. And when everyone else in the hall was drunk and snoring, Ochnar approached Grimnir and offered him a brimming horn. He said his father was wrong to torture Grimnir without cause. Grimnir gratefully drained the horn. The fires had crept so close that they singed the cloak on his back. Then Grimnir began to talk. Fall back, fire, you are too fierce. My cloak is smoldering, flames scorch the fur. For eight nights now I've waited here and I've been ignored by all except Ochnir. Garold's son will be hailed as a ruler of all the Goths and Burgundians. Greetings, Ochnar. The Lord of Men greets you. You'll never be better rewarded for a gift of a single drink. Listen now. Where gods and elves live, the land is hollowed, and Thor will live in Thridrain until all the gods are destroyed. The other gods have halls, too. The first is called Idali. Dales where ewes grow, and Ulk lives there. The second is Alfheim, where the light elves live. The gods gave that place to Freyr when he cut his first tooth. The third is called Valhalaskelf, Hall of the Slain. One god built it for himself, and with their own hands and the others thatched it with silver. The fourth is Solquebec, the sinking floor. It is lapped on all sides by cool, murmuring water, and there, every day, Odin and Saga drink joyfully from golden goblets. The fifth is Gladsheim, home of gladness, and Valhalla stands nearby, vast and gold-bright. Odin presides there, and day by day he chooses slain men to join him. Every morning they arm themselves and fight in the great courtyard and kill one another. Every evening they rise again, ride back to the hall and feast. That hall is easily recognized. Its roof is made of shields and its rafters are spears. Breastplates litter the benches. A wolf lurks at the western door and an eagle hovers over it. Antremer, the cook, smutty with soot, boils the boar, say Rimnir's flesh in a great blackened cauldron. That is the finest of all food, though few men get to taste it. The war father feeds his wolves, Freki and Gari, with hunks of meat, but wine alone is always enough for Odin's own needs. Every morning two ravens, Hugan and Munin, are loosed and fly over Midgard. I always fear that thought may fail to wing his way home, but my fear for memory is greater. The torrent thund roars through Valgrind, Valhalla's outer gate, and the sun, the fish of the wolf, dances in the water. The river looks so deep and wild that the slain fear they will not be able to wade across it. Behind Valgrind are the sacred inner doors, and although the gate is age old, few know how to bolt it. Valhalla itself has five hundred and forty doors, and when the time comes to fight against Fenrir, eight hundred warriors will march out of each door, shoulder to shoulder. The sixth is Thrymheim, the place of uproar set in the mountains. That's where the great giant Thiazi lived. Now it's owned by his daughter, the fair Skadi. She was Nior's bride. The seventh is Breidelblik. Broad splendor Baldur has set up his hall there, in beautiful country, blessed and untainted by any evil. The eighth is Hamburg, 
the cliffs of heaven, and Heimdall is master of it. The watchman of the gods sits in his fine hall, drinking mead. The ninth is Folkvong, the field of folk, and Freya decides who shall enter Sesrumnir, the hall there. Every day she shares the slain with Odin. The tenth is Glitnir. It has pillars of red gold, and its roof is inlaid with silver. That's where Forseti is most often found, sitting in judgment and resolving strife. The eleventh is the harbor Noatun, and Niord, blameless ruler of men, presides there in his high timbered temple. The twelfth is Vidi, where Vidar lives a land of long grasses and saplings, but that brave god will leap down from his steed when he has to avenge his father's death. The goat grazing outside Valhalla is called Hydrun. She nibbles the shelterer Lyraid's branches, and every day she is milked and fills a great pitcher with fine, clear mead. That pitcher seems quite bottomless. And the deer wandering outside Valhalla is oak thorned. He nibbles the branches of Lyrad too, and from his horns a stream drops into Hevelgamer, the roaring cauldron. That is the spring from which runs every river in the nine worlds. Listen to their names Slow and Broad, Saken and Aken, Cool and Loud Bubbling. Battle Defiant Fiorn, and Rin and Rinandi, Japul and Gopal, the torrent, old and spear teeming, Vin and Hall and Thal, Grod and Gunthorin. These are the rivers that make their way across the fair fields of Asgard. But that is not all. Veen and Vegsveen that knows where to go, Night and Nought, and the river that sweeps people away. Non and Hrun, Slid and Hirud, Stilgal and Ilgal, Vid and Fond, Stond, Giol and Leet. They are the rivers that course through Midgard and cascade from Middle Earth straight into Hell. When the gods go each day to meet in council at the well of Erd, Thor has to wade across the rivers Kormt and Ormt, and the two car logs. All the other gods gallop over Bifrost, and their steeds are called Joyous and Golden, Shining and Swift, Silver-maned and Sinewy, Gleaming and Hollow-hoofed, and gold mane and Light-feet. The ash tree, Yggdrasal, has three roots. One is embedded in Nibelheim, another in the world of the Frost Giants, the third in Midgard. All day and every day, the squirrel Ratatosk scurries up and down its trunk. He is carrying insults between the eagle perched in the topmost branch and the serpent Nihog, the corpse sucker in Nibelheim. Four hearts throw down their heads and stretch to nibble the tender topmost twigs. They are Dane, Devan, Denir, and Duthathor. And underneath Yggdrasil are more serpents than a slow-witted man would dream of. Goin and Moin, the sons of the gnawing wolf, Grabak and Gravelbulf, the bewilderer and the bringer of sleep. They will gnaw the roots of the tree until the end of time. Yggdrasil suffers great hardship than men realize. The deer crop is crowned. Nithog gnaws the roots, and the trunk itself is rotting. In Valhalla, Shaker and Mist, Axe Time and Raging, take its turns to bring me my brimming horn. The nine other Valkyries bring ale to the slain warriors. Their names are Warrior and Might, Shrieking, Host, Fetter and Screaming, Spear Bearer, Shield Bearer, Wrecker of Plans, and Kin of the gods. Arvok, the early waker, and Alsvi, all swift are the names of the steeds whose weariness work is to drag the sun across the sky. Long ago, the gods took pity on them and put bellows under their yokes. And in front of the sun, like a shield, stands Svalin. Should he let his gallop slip, 
the mountains and the seas would burst into flames. Skoll is the wolf on the tail of the sun, and he will chase her until at last he runs her down in ironwood, and Hati and the Hidravir's son is the wolf in pursuit of the moon. The earth was made by Emir's flesh and the oceans from his blood. The gods made the hills out of his bones, and trees from the hair and the sky dome is his skull. They used his eyebrows to build the mountain wall, Midgard, as a safeguard for men, and out of his brains they shaped the welling dark clouds. Uk and the other gods will smile on the first man to reach these flames. They could all look through the vent and see my plight if someone would move that cauldron aside. Long ago the sons of the mighty dwarf Ivaldi made Skidbladnir best of all ships. It was a gift for Freyr. Likewise, Yggdrasil is the finest of trees, Odin the greatest of gods, and Slipnir the swiftest of steeds. Bifrost is the bridge of bridges, and Brayi the best of wordsmiths. Hobrok is the finest hawk, and Garum the finest hound. I have raised my face to the gods, and they have heard me, all those who sit and drink at Eir's banquet. I will tell you my names. I am Grim, I am Gongaleri, I am Raider, and the Helmeted One. I am the Pleasant One, and the Third. I am Thud, and Ood. I am Deathblinder, and the High One. I am Sad, and Zvilpal, and Sangotal. I am Glad of War, and Spear Thruster. I am One-Eyed, Flame-Eyed, Worker of Evil. I am Fil Alnir and Grimnir, the Hooded One. I am Glassbid and Fielsbid. I am Deep Hood and I am Longbeard. I am Sigfrod and Niklud. I am All Father. I am Atrid and the Cargo God. I have never been called by one name alone since I first showed myself in Midgard. In Gehrod's Hall, I am known as Grimnir, and Osmod knows me as Gelding. I was called Keel Ruler when I traveled on a sledge, and at the Council of the Gods, I am called Thorar. Yudur is my name when I go into battle, and the gods have known me just as high, fulfiller of desire, shouter and spear shaker. Gahran Mir, the wand bearer, and Greybeard harbored. I took the names of Svidur and Svidari to deceive the giant Sokmimir. I slew him, Midvinir's famous son. The god turned his head from the young prince Aknar and turned his terrible gaze on King Gahrog. You are drunk, Garog. You're drunk yourself, stupid. Think of all you've lost. Neither I nor any of my slain warriors will raise a hand to help you now. How little you have acted on all I once told you. The messenger you trusted betrayed you, and now I see my friend's sword bared and shining with blood. Ig, the terrible one, will soon lay claim to your pierced body, for your life has come to an end. The Norns have nothing but death to offer you. Look at me. I am Odin. Draw your sword against me if you dare. Now, I am Odin. I was the terrible one, the thunderer, the wakeful, and the shaker. I was the wanderer and the crier of the gods. I was father and bewilderer and bringer of sleep. All these names are one name. They are names for none but me. Gerold sat and listened. His sword lay across his lap, half sheathed. When he heard his guest reveal that he was Odin, he leaped up to release him, but the sword slipped from the king's hand and fell hilt first to the ground. Then Gehrod stumbled and fell on his sword, so that it skewered him and killed him. Odin vanished then, and Aknar became king and ruled for a long time. And here, is where I end my tale for today. 
but I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.